All right, hey, let's, let's start. Hey, so um, let me, let me, yeah, let's g grab a seat, man. <laughs> Yo, if uh, just if you're watching on the stream, you need. Um, yeah, let's get started. The, it's a really nice day today, man. It's a really nice day. The first or maybe second really nice day. Um, okay. Hang on, seriously. Let's. We're gonna start. Hey, um, no. So no phones, no laptops, and no laptops, dude. Dude. Yeah. And, um, yo, hang on. Since, let me, here's a lesson in, here, here's a lesson in sociology. So, you know, we're all shaped by factors and forces that we don't necessarily see. And one thing that I see over the years is the way in which behavior in groups doesn't really change, which is what the study of sociology is, right? And it's about all the ways in which we're shaped by factors and forces outside of our control that we don't see, okay? And What's interesting is that always on the first couple of days of spring, which I really, I really, as much as I enjoy the weather, um, it's very difficult to maintain kind of just a sense of decorum in the class um, because it's just so nice because you all just, you just get influenced by things, by these like invisible strings that are affecting, affecting us, you know, it keeps us from staying focused. Um, so two things. One, we're gonna have our attendance quiz in a few minutes, but we're also passing the attendance sheets around. So that means um, don't, if you're, don't be texting the attendance codes to your friends, because if they're not here to sign the attendance sheets, they're gonna be in hot water and we're checking signatures. So don't sign for your friends. Dude, dude, what else? Yeah. This is exactly what you was talking about. Yeah, this is the guy right here. Who is he? He, he? This is the academic weapon. Okay. He like a TikTok influencer? He's a TikTok guy. Dude, dude. <laughs> Look at this guy. He looks like the guy who was sitting here in the front. Yeah, he's the guy who was sitting there in the front last semester, Doug. That was me right there. That was me. That was me. All right, dude. Nice seeing you, man. You remember this guy? Yeah. He's the ultimate I know. academic I weapon. I know. No, I know. I love what you're doing. Yeah, I love what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So you just, you just. All right, man. All right, I, gotta, I have to start class, bro. Come next Tuesday. Next Tuesday? Yeah, next Tuesday. We have a special guest. All right, I'll, All right, I'll see you, man. <laughs> Dude. I love this guy. <laughs> hey, by the way, can I, can I just, I just want to tell you something really fast. Hang on, hang on. We're going to bring it down. Bring it down really again. All right. By the way, if you're watching the stream, that, his name is Brad. He's just this dude. He's a guy, on, a TikTok guy. But what I want to say is, um, no, he's, 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 a, he's a good guy. Um, it's really difficult to do what he does. 
like a lot of people think it's not like it's so difficult to do what what he does like every day just going every single day and putting yourself out there it's for me as a sociologist it's utterly fascinating dude anyway i'm going to introduce this guy in a second but first i'm going to can we go to the go to the no go to back to the to yeah right there okay so hang on okay we're now we're officially starting um, Be Boom Jun. How did I do? Bom. Bom Jun. Be Bom Jun. Um, this gentleman right here um, started watch. So the, people watch Swiss so 19 stream, all right? And sometimes people translate it and it goes out in, di in different countries, watch in different videos. If we're talking about a specific country, people watch. Um, He's from Korea, and he started watching the class, the, the, the videos that were translated into Korean, and he became a fan of the class. And he reached out to me a couple months ago and said, I want to come to your class and perform. He plays cello. Now, what you need to know about him is that he has an intellectual disability, a severe intellectual disability. So you're gonna, he's coming next week. So he's gonna be here and here Tuesday and Thursday. Because I invited him. I said, come on over, let's go. Like, absolutely. And so we're gonna do some things related to, he's gonna talk, he's performed at the UN, he's performed in different places, but the important thing is, he has a severe intellectual disability. So he's, he's a savant, and he plays the cello really well, as a savant plays the cello. So he's going to perform for us, and also we're going to talk about issues related to intellectual disabilities, and we're going to talk about Korea, and I think, Leah, I think, right? He wants to do a tea ceremony, a Korean tea ceremony for us, or with us. So we'll get some volunteers and we'll do a Korean tea ceremony, which is awesome. And so for me, the fact that this young man would reach out from the other side of the, the world, and he's coming with his mother and his sister, because he can't, he can't make the trip by himself. Um, it's just so, it's heartwarming. So I'm telling you that ahead of time. So next Tuesday is gonna be a really special day. Um, and then on Thursday, he'll be here on Thursday as well. So I'll have him perform before class. We'll ask him to perform before class on Thursday. So, so that's cool, right? Is that awesome? Yeah, so it's really a special opportunity, I think. Okay. Um, First off, this guy, this is Will, Will Smart. Um, I, this, there are, there are, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go back to the world and conversation slide, actually, Leah. Uh, but since you're standing here, I just have to, I don't want you to stand any more awkwardly. Once in a while, as, as, a, as a professor, um, we, you know, we get to meet students. Like, so it's like room, every semester is a room full of people. and. One of the really cool things about being a professor is we meet people along the way who are just special, really special. So uh, this is one of these really special guys. And he's in town and initially I said, hey, why don't you come and do your pitch for Teach for America? But in the end, he said he was free the whole time and I'm like, dude, you gotta be here with us. So anyway, man, dude, just say hello and then I'm gonna say something about World in Conversation. Just Hey, what's going on, everybody? All right, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, hang on. Right. Dude, I love this guy. They're just people you know. When you don't have kids, hang on, I want to say this. When you don't have kids, you, the, and I can like, meet all these people in my life, and I'm just like, damn, I wish that was my daughter, or damn, I wish that was my son. That's how my wife and I feel about this guy. Can you go back to world and conversation? So I want to, I want to say a couple things, and I want you to pitch in. Um, listen, what we do at, at World in Conversation is we train P 
people in the skills of facilitation, meaning that we train them how to be in a group and be like traffic cops, you know, like, because what you want in every group is for the best possible conversation to happen. If it's a, if it's a, just a social group or a work group or like with your colleagues or a small classroom, you want the best possible ideas to emerge out of that group. In, in order to have that, you have to have someone who plays the role of the facilitator, who is able to ask really good questions, who's able to get some people to be quiet in certain moments and bring other people out. It's kind of like you ever watch a, like a symphony, a, an orchestra conductor, they're like bringing up the violins and tuning, pulling down the cellos and whatever. And it's like, they make a really beautiful uh, array of, no of sound, wall of sound. That's what facilitators do. And what we have found from our graduates over the past 20 years is, and I'm not saying, I'm going to say this, bro, and then you're, I, want, I need you to comment on it, okay? Almost every single one comes back and says, the skills that I use in the workplace, in my day-to-day -day life, that are most important and most valuable have been the skills I learned as a facilitator. And they say, the thing that got me ahead in my job, or the thing that got me the interview, or the thing that got me the job, or the promotion, I cannot tell you how many people come back and say, it is the skills I learned as a facilitator. And so we are in the process of recruiting people for the next fall's team. So, Will, how much do you use this? He, Will was one of our trainers. He worked alongside of Lori. So he's like an, a lead trainer, really advanced trainer. Like, yeah, yeah. Hey, what's going on, everybody? So look, uh, Sam is plugging in a really powerful opportunity, right? But look, let me ask you a quick question because you don't believe him. You don't, you're not going to believe me. How many people think sociology is important? Show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. All right, all right. My guy right here, why is sociology important? <laughs> uh, has to do with people, you interact with people every day. Has to do with people, anyone wanna add? <laughs> anyone brave enough to wanna add to that? It has to do with people, it has to do with groups, right? Here's the thing. You're in college, you're learning these really cool things, you're learning about social stratification, social inequity, you're learning about difference between races and income classes, and all that is cool, but in the real world, it's completely different. The academy is different than reality. And the work that we do at World in Conversation is basically, we don't just stop at sociology, we begin to apply it. And here's the thing, most people don't know how to apply what they learned in the real world. And so when you do world in conversation, what you're doing, you're working with people, but you're getting people to learn how to think together because most times people don't know how to think. Common sense and critical thinking is not a great skill that a lot of people have, why? Because people don't know how to understand how to see people in the broader context of, so, uh, of society. They don't know how to look at power dynamics. They don't know how to look at how a society impacts an individual and how you show up in a room. And when you're a facilitator, you learn how to see the world differently. The work is so powerful and the reason that a lot of facilitators get ahead in their corporate workspaces and their jobs is because they learn how to see the world differently. And of seeing the world differently allows you to just do amazing things, move mountains, inspire people to think together because people don't know how to think together. And so what I'll say is like, if you're interested in an opportunity that can really change your life, I would definitely urge you to consider learning more about World in Conversation and how you can get involved. Cause it changed my life. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for World in Conversation. That's all I have to say. Dude, that's big. <laughs> yeah, that's big. It's the skills, man. It's the skills. You just can't imagine how good you become sitting in a circle of people, which you do all the time in your job. And just being able to know how to ask the questions and get things out of people. And man, it is uh, awesome. It's, it's, it's the most powerful skill in yeah. the world. 
right? And you're not going to believe me, but if you see what's going on in the world, if you pay attention to what's going on in the world, you'll start to see why it is. All right, so listen, man, that's the, that's, you, if, you, if you pop up right there, I'm, I sent it out to you all, so, but there, there it is again. You can go, take you to the webpage where you um, can get more information and find, get an info, go to an info session. All right, next slide. Um, let's just do the quiz really fast, and then we'll be done, and then we'll start. Hey. Are you ready? We good? All right, man. Um, go to the next slide. All right, so listen, man, so you, you got Will. So, Will, what, what, what are you doing here? What do you do? What are you doing here? Oh, yeah. uh, okay. All right, first of all, first of all, look, I try to tell y'all about world and conversation. I don't feel like I really got y'all attention, man. So, look, I'm going to do something else to really amp y'all up. So, I am a Penn State alum, class of 2019. So, Sam, you already know what time it is. Dude. So, I'm going to say we are... That was uh, so weak. We are. We are. Thank you. Man, y'all do not know how to greet an alum, man. They, I thought they taught that at uh, convocation. But look, I'm a proud Penn State alum. I, did, I took this class, what, almost 10 years ago now. Yeah. I'm getting old. And hold on. Let's bring the energy back down. So I took this class almost 10 years ago, truly powerful class. Look, you're already at the end of the semester, so you already know how powerful it is. And I studied psychology, global international studies, and after I graduated, I started off teaching, and I did teach for America, and now I recruit for them. And I wanted to come here just to tell people who are interested in making a difference a little bit about this opportunity. But before I even tell you about this opportunity, you already know I'm going to ask you a question. So look, I need some brave volunteers. So look, I'm going to ask a question, think about it, and I need, I'm going to ask someone to share their response. I want you to think about this world, and I want you to think how different the world would be if every person in positions of power, think of like your lawmakers, your presidents, your doc doctors, lawyers, deans of colleges. Let's say they had experience working in an underserved community. How do you think the world would be different? What would happen if our leaders in position of power actually had experience working amongst the people? Now let me get a volunteer. Let me see a, a raised hand. Who's going to be brave? There we go. All the way over here. I think, okay. I think that we'd see more policies passed that would help those groups of people because I think it's very hard to understand those circumstances when you can't relate to them at all. So I think forcing people to kind of be in those shoes would help them understand the issues and so the policies passed would be more beneficial. Oh, bingo, let's give her a round of applause for that, come on. <laughs> what, what do you study? Education and public policy. Oh, all right. Well, that was easy. One. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, that the reason I asked that question is because that question. Let's bring it back. Almost there. That question is so foundational to our mission. See, a lot of people see Teach for America and they think, "Oh, I either got to be a teacher or I don't want to be a teacher." This is not even for me, dog. Right? But that's not the case. Teach for America, yes, it's an education-based nonprofit, but it's also a leadership development organization. 
right? And our philosophy is that we're trying to find passionate leaders and we're gonna help them develop their talents to have an immediate impact and ultimately change our society for the better, right? The issue that defines our mission is this issue called educational inequity. And basically what that is, it's like, in this today, a child's zip code still determines their educational futures, their, uh, their access to resources, which ultimately determines their long-term outcomes. 16 million children are living below the poverty line today. 50% will drop out of high school before they graduate. Only one in 10 will end up with a college degree, right? And it's not just a classroom issue. This affects our society with the mass incarceration, with the school to prison pipeline, income inequalities, health disparities, any social issue you learn in this classroom ties back to education. So that's why we believe we have to start there. And we believe it's a solvable issue. And our idea is that we're looking for passionate people that really want to make an impact. And we ask you to join us in this larger movement for equity and justice. And we support you to have an immediate impact by serving as a, a two-year classroom teacher in a low-income, historically underserved community. Because there, you're learning, leaning into your talents, making an impact. But more importantly, you're getting coaching, resources, and support from Teach for America to not just make an impact on the lives of your students, but to learn how to expand opportunities and uh, change systems, broken systems that are unwilling and resistant to change. And then at the end of your two years, you can choose to continue your, co your commitment by staying as a teacher, or you can use our ongoing leadership and development pathways to go into law school, medical school, end up on Capitol Hill, start your own organization. So it's more than just teachers in this fight with us. We just believe that we have to start in the classroom. And by starting there, starting by working in the most underserved communities in America, you will be a lifelong advocate, no matter what sector you're interested in and pursuing changing. And that's what Teach for America is, all right? Um, that's just a high level overview. Do we have time for questions? Or? No, let's have, let, let's have, let's have Dela. Okay, first thing. Dude, Dela from the stream team is gonna be, you're, you're joining Teach for America. I am. Yeah, I am. Well, then you, were, you were in the room when this guy spoke last fall. Yeah, I was in this class uh, last semester, and now I'm going to be a teacher, a special education teacher down in Atlanta after I graduate this semester. And you're not an education major? No, I'm a psychology major, and originally when I saw this, I kind of wrote it off because of that. I was like, oh, well, that's not what I'm focused in. But then Will said that when he was at Penn State, he was a psychology major, same as me, and that really piqued my interest. And so you... So at some point you were sitting here going like, hey, this is not for me. And then you're like, hey, I don't have a job, so let me go for it. Yeah, originally I didn't know what I was going to do after graduation. Um, the expectation was to further educate. And then I heard about this program. It aligns with my morals. It really makes a difference. And it's reaching people who often get left behind. And that really struck a chord with me. So... I thought, I got nothing better to do. This is a great opportunity. Might as well join. Dude, and Will, and she's going to have a full salary, benefits, the whole nine yards, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even tell you about that part. Yeah, full salary, full benefits. You can expect to make anywhere between forty to $70,000 a year. Your first year out of undergrad. Who said teachers don't make money? Uh, you're going to get $12,000 throughout your two years to put towards student loans or grad school. Your student loans are going to get on, be on forbearance, so when President Joe Biden fails us and we have to start paying them again, right, you're going to be covered, okay? Um, and then we also offer like 100 plus employer and graduate school partnerships that offer things like scholarships, tuition discounts, application fee waivers, mm. increased chance of admission into the program. So there's a lot, lot of logistical benefits, and we're nationwide. We place in 38 regions across the country, and Dela is going to be in the ATL. Okay, let's give it up for her, man. That's important. Okay. <laughs> uh, dude, you're the best, man. Hey, can you, you guys, are you ready? Let's go. Uh, yeah, can you scan that? Hey. All right, so look, I need y'all to do me a favor really quick. Hold on. Let's bring it back so, so y'all can get back with your class, okay? Look, I drove all the way up from Philly for this. And so I need y'all to do me one favor. I need you to scan, take out your phones. I need you to scan this QR code and I need you to fill it out, right? 
So for one, logistically, I need to just show evidence that I was here. It's just a quick, uh, your name, email, your year. And what I'll do is, I'll just send you a quick email with just some resources to help you learn more about Teach for America, right? If you're not interested, you could just ignore the email. But if you are, there's a chance to explore our programming, learn more about our undergraduate internship program, which is just five hours a week virtually, $1,200 a semester, and also learn more about the two-year core program. Dude. All right, so go ahead and fill that out. Thank you so much. Like, this whole section has their phones out filling it out. This section's catching up. There we go. The back is slacking. Let's get those phones out, scan it. I see you. I, I was a student here, right? That section, almost <laughs> done. <laughs> and when y'all done, just, just show me your phone when you're done, just so I can just see, get some evidence that y'all actually submitted. There we go, he showed me the phone. Oh, there we go, I'm seeing some phones back there. There we go. All right, listen. There we go, man. winner, winner, chicken dinner, right? So awesome, awesome, my guy. And I'm loving that hat, brother. I'm loving it. Come on, brother. There we go. All right, listen, man. I'm going to tell a Will story, and then we're going we're to introduce these two lovely folks. All right, here we go. Come down. See, you bring them up, and i got to bring them down now. Hey, uh, when Will was a student, you were a freshman. You were like 17 years old, I think. Yeah, I was a freshman, 17 years old at the time, he used back to, in the day. He used to sit. All right, hang on. He used to sit right here in this seat. And one day, I asked a question and I gave him the mic and he started talking. I don't know what it, I don't know what we were talking, I don't know what it was about, but you, I, I just went, damn, all right, hang on a minute. You stand up here and talk. And I sat down and you just went on for about 10 minutes and I was mesmerized by what you were saying. And then here you are again, man. It's so awesome to, to have you back. Hey, can we introduce the, can you two introduce yourselves? Hi, um, I'm Sophia. I'm a freshman. My major is communication sciences and disorders. Awesome. Yeah, um, I'm Eli. My, I am a junior finance major. What's your major? Finance. Finance? And so you're a freshman. Yeah. You can apply to you guys applying to be facilitators? Just think about it. Dude. See that see that look? See the look on both of them, man? Damn. Yeah, they, they were like, oh well, I didn't come down here for this. <laughs> All right. Hey, so I want to talk we're gonna talk about critical race theory today. Tell what what is what, can either can both of you define it for us? And, and your job is just be up here with me, man. We're yeah, just going to be brother. going back and forth, you and I, yeah, just like together. That. Who wants to start? You know, and by the way, you don't have to get it right. Like, you, don't, you can say, I don't know. It's fine. But the point is, um, what do you think it is? I think it's like how, like, laws and how, like, how laws and policies are made affect, like, like racism, like, unknowingly. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I know some people think that it like divides people, like, in like Who's their it, ideas. It divides the the, uh, the, the U.S. like the yeah, Americans or whatever. How does it divide people? Um, some like some people think like the way uh, it's taught in like schools and stuff divides like people of color and then um, like white people, I guess. Mm -hmm. Can you say about how, well, how it would divide people? Do you have a sense of that, Sophia? So Eli, Sophia. Got that, bro? Eli, Sophia. Can you say something about how you think it divides, how people think it divides people? Um, I think some people think that it makes like a racist feel inferior to, like, like to the other mm -hmm. or like they're better than the other race mm -hmm. so they like want to take it out of schools mm -hmm. so it's to, it's creating a divisive atmosphere and going back to what you said so it's really looking not at and so it's a way of thinking yeah. that is really not just looking at, at individual behavior but looking at the patterns, long-term historical patterns, and the unintended consequences of patterns that hold structural inequality in place. Yeah. 
is the idea. Okay, that's what you said, essentially. Bro, is that, has, is that new to you? Because that's like not a thing that people talk about. Yeah, I guess I don't really like understand a lot about it. Okay, which is fair. Most people don't. Even people that talk about it don't understand. How, so how do you think the people who critique critical race theory and who want to have it, um, hang on, can you go to the next slide? So like this, they want to, you know, ban like African-American studies courses and like these AP courses and so on, right? Or they, they you know, they don't want it in, they don't want CRT in schools and so on. What do you think they would think about Social 119? Um, they probably wouldn't like it if they don't want to, like, I think that's what they're trying to take out of school. So I feel like they'd be kind of shocked with this class, maybe. Yeah, because? Like, we talk about, like, race issues, like, class issues, like, a lot of issues about, like, what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, I think that's what they're trying to, like, stay away from. But is it there, is it the... Is it the people who are critical of critical race theory? Is it that they don't want to talk about race and culture issues at all? Or they don't want to talk about it in particular ways? I feel like they would usually try to make the argument that like learning like social 119 wouldn't be like beneficial to like if I'm majoring in finance, they would argue that learning stuff about like race, critical race theory wouldn't be beneficial to like my degree. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So like, and for other aspects, they would want that like. So, so the idea is we, for some people, it, like we shouldn't be talking about it at all, right? It, we should just like let it go. Is that, you would, agree? bro, what do you think? What do you think about that? Like what, what do you think people who are critical of critical race don't, don't, don't go too deep, my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. What do you think they would think about this class? Man, I, I feel like they would, they would hate this class, man. Like, don't you examine, like, race and, and power? Like, you got to bend social 19, man. You got to take that off the curriculum. Um, that's what I think. But, no, I would actually be really interested in asking them a question. Like, what does critical race theory make them think? Or how does it make them feel? I'd be very interested to just learn their perspective, really. <laughs> Okay, so here, let me, let me throw something out, right, to you all. Um, can, you go, can you go to the, so here, this is a, a comment on one of our videos, or it was an email. I get emails every day from people, right? So, so read, read this. This is a, was a comment or an email that I got, okay. right? Okay, so setting aside the dumb Democrats statement, right? Because I don't, I'm, I obviously I can't get on board with that. But um, I actually find that lots of people who are very critical, they have, they have the idea that what we're trying to do is jam divisive race issues down people's throats and brainwash children to have a certain perspective on race and a very divisive perspective on race, a perspective on race in this country that like really, that condemns white people as you know, all, like, like white people are racist. The system is, it's a, it's a white system that benefits white people. Um, and it just leads us to all this anti-whiteness stuff, which is like, uh, or, or anti-straight people, anti-men, anti-whatever it is, right? And there's a certain perspective that has been adopted and it's embodied by critical race theory that most people have no idea what really critical race theory is. And largely it's kind of, it's what you had said, right? But, you know, and that people have a fear. It's like the class we did two weeks ago when I was, we were talking about trans issues and people have this idea that 
these trans activists are hijacking school systems and like teaching, talking about trans issues with young kids and getting young children to question their own sexuality even. And like who's teachers in schools, that, that's not for teachers in schools to do, to, uh, to be asking like eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds what their pronouns are. You know, that, that's just not the place to do it. And so all you need are a few examples out there of that happening. One example, you, you know, you got like tens of millions of school children in the United States. You just need one classroom. And then that leads people to be fearful that this is happening all across the United States. And so what they don't want is a really divisive way of talking about this stuff. But I want to ask the two of you, but why do you think this person here is saying like, hey, I'm watching the videos of this knucklehead and I, and I really enjoy it. Like what is, what is, what is, it's probably, it feels like it's a woman, by the way. So I'm going to, but it could be a man. I don't really sure. But what do you, what do you think that person sees in this class? You've been here all semester. What do you think they see? Either of you. I mean, kind of like what they're saying in that message, um, like an unbiased opinion mm -hmm. in somewhat, and like you kind of teach both sides, like how we, like the one lecture we just watched on Thursday was like kind of swapping the places, uh -huh. and you know, I just think like you show an unbiased opinion, that's probably why, and I think they think most of the time that maybe it would be like extreme Democrats that are teaching these like critical race theories, so uh -huh. like, they would usually be making like white people feel like bad or guilty uh -huh. when like I'm assuming the way I don't know they just see it like so that you wouldn't like make it feel that way okay so as a white guy in here who's studying finance do you can you recall any moments in the semester where you were feeling kind of sheepish and bad about being a white guy that like I was kind of hammering away at you no do you have it do you have moments though as a white guy that you went like damn I'm here, I'm this white, what are you, 20? 20 year old white guy and like I didn't know about this or I don't know about that. It's like I feel kind of uneducated or we use the word ignorant but I don't like to use that word because it it's, has certain provocative connotations but like I'm unknowledgeable about these things and I really could probably have a dose of catching up, right? Which is what you get in this class. Have you had those moments in here? Yeah, I definitely have had like those moments in here, like with the whitewashing, which is what we talked about before. I've never like heard of that before. Uh huh. Um, uh huh. But yeah, some things like I don't want to say like I would seem ignorant towards. It's just things I've never thought about before I came in here. Yeah, yeah. You don't think about them, right? Just like I don't. I didn't think. I don't think about teaching un underprivileged kids or like under in underprivileged classrooms. I don't think about that because it's not what I do, right? So why would I think about that? How would I have any idea? Can, as a, are you, how old are you, 18? Yeah. So, Sophia, have you, how, how, what, how many moments have you had in here as a young 18-year-old woman of color where, where I have led you to check yourself on something, to be like, oh, yeah, hang on a second. Have you had any of those? No. You haven't had any? Not really. No. Yeah? Where, you, where you're like, wait, hang on a second. Like the one where we talked about privilege. Okay. Because you're privileged. Right. Yeah. How, <laughs> dude? Can you can you look at her and be like, "Yeah, she's privileged." Yeah, you're privileged. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you go to Penn State. That's like yeah. a huge privilege. Some of the kids that you're teaching, man, these schools for you were, dude. Can you just describe a couple of schools? Oh. <laughs> just to hang on. So listen. How was your high school? Yeah, I have thought about it because like I went to a good school like I never like I don't really think about that many things you know like all right about anything okay but now you do now I'm checking you right now right so now I'm like pulling it up and being like okay dude tell her about a couple schools tell her about a couple of school where she could have gone to oh yeah I mean like a lot of people that go to Penn State it's like we just don't think we just don't think, man. We're just trying to make it to finals. Look, graduation is like in a few weeks. We got finals week coming up. A lot of people, we just don't think of our circumstance, but really a lot of things we just take for granted. Like, uh, 
Like, for instance, I can just do, I can ask you, or I can even just do a, 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 a survey by a show of hands of just like, how many people, listen up, went to a school in which every classroom had a window? By a show of hands. Every classroom in your school had a window to get fresh air and sunlight. Okay, well, yeah, that's not a reality in a lot of schools across the country, both urban and rural. That's just one example, right? Um, like, ugh, like how many people went to a, like how many people went to a school where you actually had a chemistry lab with like an actual a chemical? No, set? hang on, do do the reverse. reverse. How many people went to a school where you did not have a chemistry lab at all? Like there was nothing happening in there. Raise your hands. Yeah, raise your hand. Like no Erlenmeyer flask. You know? Yeah, we got one, two, three. Yeah. So how about how about your school? Chemistry labs? Nice chemistry labs, bro. Nice chemistry labs. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, how about this? Uh, how many people went to a school where the primary form of transportation was like driving or having your parents drop you off? Show of hands. Okay. Well, how about the other one? What about the primary form of transportation being like a bus or school bus or having a walk? Like about a third, right? Like a how about not having a gym? Oh, yeah. How many people have a, a school that actually has a, a gym? No, like, they didn't have a gym. You had no, no gym. No gym. Yeah, no gym. No gym at all. No gym. Y'all did gym in the cafeteria probably. Where did you do gym? I did gym outside. I did gym outside. Outside? I saw a hand here, right? Where did you do gym? Outside. Outside? Anyone do gym in the cafeteria? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so like these are like just a few things we just don't even think about, right? Uh, all right, how about this? How many people's mom would pack them lunch for school? Yeah, yeah, I figured, right? <laughs> so, so here's the idea, right? So come back to critical race theory, right? Yeah, so, yeah, let's, let's bring it back, let's bring it back, let's bring it back. So one of the things that people are really afraid of, and I get emails Every day I get emails from people and one of the things that they that emails like this that are saying like what I have we have the fear or I have the fear that what we've had our school systems have been hijacked by radical leftists who are jamming a philosophy of race divisiveness down the throats of all the students and in the end what we're doing is dividing society right but what we're seeing is Mm, but that doesn't seem to be happening in this classroom because you know you try to take multiple sides and you know that's that's not what you're trying to do and in fairness for me as a as a citizen of the United States um, I feel like they have something to there's something to be said for that the the irony is that <laughs> that's me dude yeah dog the irony is to the two of you, right? So two years ago, you can pull any segment, and this is, let this be a lesson to you all, right? You can pull any segment out of any of our videos. You pull like 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 20 seconds, or you take two 15 second clips and you put them together and you can make any story that you want. And so they pulled this clip together of me talking to this white guy and publicly they decided this was, you know, Fox and the whole the whole right wing anti critical race theory folks. They decided that the way to frame this for people was to to tell viewers that I was publicly shaming white people to hate themselves for being white. And then I was the embodiment of critical race theory ideology, that this class was everything that critical race theory, that's wrong with critical race theory. And so the people who watched the videos or read the articles, the short little clip that they made or read, or, or read the articles, started sending me hate emails like to the tune of like every minute or so. And, uh, and, and that's what happens. But in fact, this class is the opposite of that, right? So now, um, yeah, look at that, man. That's crazy. All right, do you have a question about that? Either of you have a question for me? Do you have a question, bro? 
All right, man. Can you go to the next slide? All right, so here. The problem that we run into is that we have to come up with an explanation for things that are wrong in the world, okay? And the explanation is either going to land on people themselves or systems or things that are outside of our control, things that people don't really create. Like nobody wants poor schools. Nobody wants there to be schools in the United States where, the, where classrooms don't have windows, where kids don't have a gymnasium, where people don't have books. Students don't have books, right? You have, yeah. You've taught without books. Right? Yeah, a lot of students don't have books or can't get to school or it's just a lot. And a lot of people think it's just urban air and it's rural and it's everywhere. And, and nobody wants that. There's no one in the United States that would say that's a good thing. Wait, hang on. Yo. Yo, 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 bro. Dude. So nobody wants that, okay? So the problem is we got to understand what the reasoning is. And we want to understand, like, why it is the kids in some schools, like in your school, very few kids dropped out of your high school, I'm sure. Probably very few kids dropped out of your high school. But, but this guy has worked in high schools where lots of kids drop out. And so we want to understand why that is. What's the reason for it? So either A, we look at the kids themselves and we say, you know, you don't drop out. You're going to destroy your life if you drop out. Do your homework. Do what you need to do. Don't get disciplined, right? Don't commit crimes. Don't get whatever it is, right? Work hard. Study. Do whatever you need to do. Overcome the obstacles, right? And then when people don't do that, then the problem is, then we say, like, well, that's your fault. You had a choice. But there's another set of explanations. And you've heard me say this before, where it's like people mostly follow other people around them. People, we're, we're shaped by things that are really outside of our control. Like, we don't really understand the ways in which, for example, Sophia, like, you, I'm sure you have the idea that, and, and Eli, did you go to a good high school? Was it a good school? Yeah. Um, yeah, I went to like a public school, but it was pretty good. Pretty good? Okay. So the two of you don't have, the, you don't uh, think about the degree to which the school you went to is largely responsible for the fact that here you are at Penn State, right? That you're going to be inclined to think that, hey, the decisions I, Sophia, made or I, Eli, made, like I overcame the obstacles. I did the things that I needed to do to climb these stairs of upward mobility. Like I did that. It's me. Like, I worked really hard to make that happen. So the two of you, you know, you pat yourselves on the back because you're like, yeah, I did all that. But what you don't see Unless you go hang out with this guy in one of these classrooms, what you don't see are all the, the, the ways in which a community and an environment and not just your home, but the homes of all the people around you and, and, and money and jobs and the schools that just suck and schools that have like water. Is, every time it rains, it's like there are leaks and, and it's just like, things falling apart. What you don't see are the ways in which those things can really stop people from this, this upward mobility. Could just stop it because you, you just imagine that you could overcome the obstacles. Like you have no choice but to imagine that for the two of you. But like critical race theory people Critical race theory tends to deconstruct this stuff over here. 
to get people to look at the larger systems in play, right? People who are critical of this have the idea that what they're doing is ignoring these things over here. They're saying that people who fail, people who don't make it, people who can't, yo, hey, Doe. They have this idea that people spend too much time talking about that stuff and not enough time talking about personal responsibility. Because in the end, Will, the kid that drops out makes a choice, a series of choices to drop out. Doesn't matter if that kid feels like I have no other choice because it's kind of like the two of you didn't drop out of school because you, you were never going to drop out of high school, right? Like you, it was just never going to be part of the choice. Never. And so that was not even on the table for you. And so the critics of this critical race theory have the idea that we're not giving people enough responsibility and making them take responsibility for themselves. Sure. Right? Dude, yeah. why? Can you like... Why are, how, why are you here, man? Dude, like, how did you make it? Yes. Like, what happened? Because you grew up, your, your mom's from Sierra Leone. Yeah. 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 How'd you get, what are you doing here, man? Because you're like a statistical anomaly. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. Uh, I just worked hard, man. Like, what can I say, man? Just work hard. No, 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 but something well, clicked. Explain. Yeah, no, 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 I got you. So what clicked in your brain? Right. I mean, well, look. See, the, the, the powerful thing is, like, for instance, like, just like I was saying, and just like what Sam is, is trying to say, it's just like, in our day-to-day -day life, we're just so busy just doing us that we don't even think about all the things that, that shape us, right? Yeah, I can look back at my high school and I can say, yeah, it was like, not the best high school, but if I worked hard, I did well, I earned my spot at Penn State, but also, what if I was to say that I had teachers that reached out to nonprofit organizations to like get like me and my friends uh, the opportunity just to apply to a scholarship. And that's just not common in our schools, in our cities, because most of the students can't even afford to go to college. I'm from Philly. Most students can't afford to go to college in their own city, right? Or the fact that it's like, oh, I had teachers that pushed me to do after school activities because, you know, colleges look at extracurricular. So it's easy to say, oh, I worked hard. I got here on my own merit. But like, what am I not seeing? Just like it's easy for you to say, oh, I'm, I'm up here at Penn State. I got it out the mud. No, you did not. How, like, you, like ugh. how many people took an SAT prep class or had an SAT prep class offered at their school? Let me see a show of hands. Yeah, that's not a reality for the other side of America that you don't see. And I think, and what I know, the most important thing in critical race theory is the part critical. Right? Just like in critical thinking, it's teaching us how to think. Because when you think and you start to realize, oh, wait, wait, why am I in this position and the people that come from that neighborhood are not in position? Why is it like that? Or, for instance, why is it that, hold on, I'm going to turn it back over to Sam. I know you love his voice. Why is it that in the, in the communities that I serve or the communities that we place teachers at, one out of every 10 kids will get their college degree. But let me give you uh, some perspective. The school I taught at, one out of every 10 kids will get their college degree by the age of 25. But if you drive just 20 minutes into Abington High School, Abington's a suburb outside of uh, Philly, nine out of every 10 kids will get their college degree by the age of 25. So what's the difference? How does 20 minutes make such a drastic difference? Is it like the kids 20 minutes down the way, do they just work harder? Or like, is there something more going on, right? So, so this is the sociology of this stuff, right? This, this is where the people who critique critical race theory, who don't understand, this is the stuff that has to be talked about. And 
and why it's essential to talk about this stuff. And I think a lot of people who critique it don't understand that this is also a part of it. So look, look for example, on these, these graphs here, right? Look at how family income is, the, is on the bottom bar in the thousands. And look at how with, as family income goes up, SAT scores go up. Now, if in fact, the playing field was really level. Like if, if schools were the great equalizer, meaning that, you know, like, hey, you can grow up, you know, the two of you might end up being poor in life and two people who grew up poor might end up being wealthy. They may just flip flop, but it's probably not gonna happen that way. It doesn't usually happen that way. It's people, it's the resources that continue to offer more resources to new people. Go to the next slide. Look at parents' education. So on the left, it's like parents who have no high school diploma, which is 7% of total parents in the United States. Here, here are the, the, the reading and math scores. Or pardon me, it's 7% of all the people who are taking the SAT, right? Look at the reading and math scores. And then look how the reading and math scores go up when parents have college degrees. And, and what this tells us, and this is that critical race theory piece, what it tells us is like we have to talk about these things. Because if we don't talk about these things, we're never going to be able to fix what would be the problem? Go to the next slide. So public education in America is unequal with different outcomes based on where you live. Yeah, definitely. 80% of us agree with that. But then look at the next one. In America, education is still the great equalizer. Well, how is it the great equalizer? Like it, it is, it can equalize, but how does it do that? Right? Can you, I have a question for you. What do you think about that? What, I, what I'm saying right now about SATs and parents' income and, like, what does that say to you about the people in this room? Most people in this room, the vast majority of us, that people in this room whose parents made the most money and people in this room whose parents were the most highly educated on average scored highest on the SATs and ACTs? Well, I, most people here had like parents who's graduated from college and stuff and you know. Uh -huh. like, well. so, but how, so, but how is that though for you, right? Like we're in this world where basically we're, we're seeing lots and lots of really privileged people Okay, because most people are the vast majority and the people who scored the best and people who end up in finance or the people who end up in certain majors or the people who end up with higher GPAs or the people who end up not having to work to put themselves through school are going to be people on average whose parents had more money and were more highly educated. And so you have more things moving. It's just like a big wave of energy. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah, um, like those people who on average are like have a um, higher SAT score, like on average going to get higher income just because they went to college. Um, it just seems like it would probably be a continuing cycle because you're going to move to neighborhoods that have better access to education. Those neighborhoods are going to be a little more expensive to live in. So if, I mean, someone who didn't graduate high school, dropped out, doesn't have a great mm -hmm. job, won't really have access to a neighborhood that has access to a good school mm -hmm. because they don't, their income just, they can't li afford to live there. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have this problem, like the suburbs, like what you were talking about and the cities, um, teachers aren't paid as well there, which then leads to like not receiving as good of an education where in the suburbs are paid probably on average more and you're just going to receive a better education out there. They're going to be. So it's just a cycle. It just, yeah. It's like a cycle to me. Do you, so do you feel a responsibility to do something about that? I mean, I like, I, I would love to say yes, but like, there's only so much I can do. Okay. I, I just, I don't know. 
Dude, I asked it that I asked him a closed-ended question. You know, you yeah. saw that. You I like, asked hey, you look, that. I, 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 hey, I just came from a degree, man. What are you talking about? No, no, no. <laughs> listen, no, no, no. I asked you that question in, in particular, like, because I you shouldn't. The, the it's not in a sense. It's not your responsibility at all, right? It's not my resp- It's not your responsibility. It's not Will's responsibility. But all of us, we our jobs as thinkers, because we are thinkers here right? We're being trained to think about social issues, philosophical issues, and so on. So we ask ourselves, what kind of society do I want to live in? Like, where do I want to live? And how do I want to live? Where do I want to be? So in that sense, that's all, that's just the question to ask yourself. It's like, well, if I don't feel responsible, then what kind of, what kind of world do I want to live in? Do you want to live in one that is like, do you want to live in one that is like highly unequal? Or would you rather live in one that's like a little bit more equal across the board? Why? Why, why do you say you'd rather have? I'm like, I want, <laughs> I don't know how to explain. Well, I think everyone should have the opportunity to get higher education if they want. I think all schools should be equal and there's definitely a difference how to help that I'm not I don't know but I think that if everything was more equal obviously it would be better well hang on nothing's ever go- like this is that video that you all watch nothing is ever going to be equal it just can't be and if we try to make everything equal we just screw it up really bad so that's not what you want you don't want it to be equal so what do you want for everyone to have the same opportunities. Not yeah, the but same maybe. opportunities, but like, like to be able to do, to get the help that they want or need to be able to pursue higher education if they're from like an underprivileged area. Like. What, what, if, what, if, what if, can I, can I say it for you? What, see if this works. No, no, these, these are great. You both, you both gave really great answers, right, bro? Great answer, dude. That's awesome, man. Look, at, listen. First off, Sophia. Yo, you're 18 years old. Okay, you're. I'm asking you these questions that can't be answered. I can't answer the question. I don't have an answer for the questions. So, like, bro, Eli, you're 20 years old. Right, you're you're asking these, um, you're an, trying to answer a question that in some ways is unanswerable. Right, this guy has an answer because this is what he does. But like, he's paid to have an answer. I don't have answers. I'm paid to not have answers. What if what if though you said it like this? Right. Look, it'd be really nice to live in a world, live in a society. Where at the very least we acknowledged some of the really extreme inequalities that exist. And we don't try to repair all of them because we can't, right? Because there's going to be kids that are going to like drop out of school no matter what. Like it doesn't matter. Like you're going to, not everybody can be a rocket scientist. This is not going to happen. There's like, it's not going to happen. So, but what if we lived in a world where we just acknowledged with a little more of an understanding, some of the really gross inequalities, some of the things that, that this guy sees and is trying to rectify, and that most people in this classroom have never seen ever, like some of the real deep inequities, right? Like, what if, what if we just lived in a world where we acknowledged a little bit more of that so that the kids who, people who don't have a lot of opportunities, if they really show great promise, like they can move forward. Like this guy didn't have a lot of opportunities, but he showed promise. I remember the time when you said that the one day you just figured out how to study. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You just figured out how to study on your own. No one taught you that. You just figured it out. Yeah. Okay. So like, what if we, what if we just lived in that world and that would be, okay, just kind of good enough. Right. How about how's that sound? Sounds pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. 
Be- because you're not saying we have to all be equal because we're not equal. Yeah. But you're acknowledging, bro, we're acknowledging the, the really deep inequalities, right? Which is like, like go, can, you go, can you go back a slide? Go, go back one more. Look at, look at this. Look at like, look at how poor kids, like, look at those differences in the SATs, man. That is like night and day. And you cannot tell the kids on the bottom, the kids on the left side of that graph, hey, just study harder. You're not going to study harder. This is, this is an analysis of all kids who take the SAT each year in the United States. And there are some kids who are poor who do really well. And there are some kids who are rich who don't do very well at all. But on average, that's the direction of that graph. And that seems to me to be something that I think needs to be acknowledged and talked about, which is why I talk about it in a class like this. And I think if people understood, if we go back to that quote of the person who was writing about this class, I think that person would agree that, like, yeah, this stuff can be talked about. Yeah. Dude, can you go, go ahead, can, Leah, can you go one more? One more, yeah, one more, one more. Go forward. Yeah, right here. Do you guys understand like here in Pennsylvania how schools are funded? Like, do you, can you, can one of you explain what the problem of that is? The 58% of funding for schools comes from local taxes. So like richer areas or places where they have higher income, they're gonna get more money from property tax because mm-hmm. like their properties are more expensive than the other places in Pennsylvania that don't have like as mm-hmm. like a higher income. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're just gener- you're just taking a bigger slice. If you take the same slice of that person's income, it's just lots more income of each household, right? So, bro, can you um Can you explain, like, what that, oh, man, I had a question for you. Do you have, do you have, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, what Sophia said. Um, if 58% of, like, funding for schools is coming from, like, local prop, like, property taxes, yeah. if you're in a higher income area on average, I mean, those funds are just going to get, like, diverted back to you, it seems yeah. like. Exactly. So why, why do you think it's like this? Like, why do you think we do this? I don't have, I don't really have any idea, but I guess, like, if people are paying more taxes in their areas, they would want their schools to be better. Mm-hmm. All right, what would your parents say if, like, if, like, a certain segment, what would your parents say, both of your parents? What would they say if, like, the state came along and said, hey, you know what? We're going to take this portion of the taxes that you pay to your school system, and we're actually going to send it to a school system on the other side of the state because we need to balance things out a little more. What would your parents say about that? I mean, generally, they probably wouldn't be too happy that, um, like, if they're on average paying higher amount in taxes, they would want it being diverted to help. Like, they would want that segment to be diverted back to to you. you know, yeah. They want it to go they want it to go to you, right? Cuz they want you to be sitting here at Penn State. They don't want you at a community college. They don't want you at a trade school. They want you to score as high as you can on your SATs. They want you to have the best possible oppor- op- opportunity cuz they want you to be sitting right here. They want you to be a finance major, bro. They don't want you to be studying a, to be an electrician which you'd probably make more money as an electrician, but that's another story, right? They want you here. And so if we're all in that boat and we all want that and the people making decisions want that, then we're going to continue like this because we're going to ensure that the children of people who are making the decisions and have the power are going to have the greatest amount of opportunities. Like, we don't want to do that, even though we don't need to do that, but we do it, which is kind of broke. Final word from you on 
Yeah. Uh, look, all I'll say is <clears throat> kind of like what Sam said. I mean, look, you don't have to want to be someone that's like, oh, we got to make everything equal. But I just ask you to be someone that wants to open your eyes, right, and seek out experiences to understand the perspectives of people that you have never met or people that you have never thought about. Um, and if you do that, the world will just be a completely different place. How so? Like, how so, dude? What do you see? Well, one thing that I see is, like, I will continue to go back to this idea. Hold on. We got, like, two minutes before y'all can go play outside, right? Um, I just see that most people are just concerned about just making it and just focus on, focusing on their next day and what life looks like for them. But hold on. Yo. But if you see this every day, and if you see the way that the other side of America lives, because it's, it's a lot worse than you think it is. Yeah. You're going to get yeah. to a point where it's like something in you can't ignore it anymore. Something in you can't ignore how unfair it is. And if you were to take a step further and study history to understand how you got here, because of unfairness in, 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 in your favor. Um, but yeah, understand the perspective of people that you have never met, you have never seen, and you can't even imagine what their life is like. That's all I have to say. All right, man. Yo, thanks to you. Thanks to you too. Hey, this is, can you put the, yeah. Um, hey, if you have questions about, this is Joy. Joy Alicious. Uh, if you have questions about world and conversation and like why you would or would not join or whatever, come talk to joy joy is the person you want to talk to and she's joyful <laughs> <laughs>